Welcome to Talks at Google. This is Scott Josephson, and you're joining us for A Matter of Taste, The Science of Mixology. Thanks so much for joining us. Today we're joined by Devin Kidner. She is the founder of Hollow Leg, an award-winning mixology company based in Chicago that focuses on the art and science of mixology through hands-on and interactive events. Please join me in welcoming Devin Kidner. Hi guys, hi Scott, thanks for inviting me on. I'm so stoked. Thanks Devin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. The weather in Chicago has been so gorgeous, which is unusual. And like life is but a dream. Of course, we're about to drink, so I couldn't be happier. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, where are you from and what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, well, gosh, I'm originally from North Carolina, but I grew up mainly in Northern Virginia. I came to Chicago about 11 years ago. And when I was a kid, I actually, I wanted to be a heart surgeon. And then I think I wanted to be an international humanitarian lawyer, whatever the heck that means. Obviously, being a mixologist isn't either of those things. So um, to my parents' deepest chagrin, I do nothing with the fancy degrees that I've earned. <laughs> Excellent. So what brought you to Chicago and what do you love most about the city? Oh, I love this city. I actually came here to get my master's degree, Scott. And when I came here, I didn't expect to fall in love. I'd never been to Chicago before. This was 2009. It dumped snow, I think, every other day, like two feet of snow. And I thought it was the most incredible and beautiful thing I had ever seen. Um, the snow is beautiful, but really it's the Midwestern people. Midwesterners are salt of the earth. They're so kind. They're so lovely, so hospitable. And the city is incredible. I mean, it's incredible. Just the architecture, the food. Um, I'm in love. I've been in love. I'll probably stay for quite some time. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. Being a native New Yorker, whenever I visit Chicago, it's always a special city to me. Definitely <laughs> a very different experience from New York, especially having the river, you know? Oh, it's incredible. The, the architecture river tour is probably one of the best things that you could do in the city, especially during the summer. It's absolutely phenomenal. I did one of those, actually. It was on a Sunday, and it was a cocktail jazz cruise. Stop it. So you had, like, the best that Chicago has to offer. You had cocktails, you had jazz, blues, as well as you had the river. Okay. I feel you. Um, it sounds like something I'm going to have to hop on to. Maybe not this summer, but next summer for sure. Oh, most definitely. So cocktails. How did you yes. first get involved? Okay, so my history is really wild. It actually is kind of like the idea that if you can dream it, you can be it. And if you stumble into it, you can make something of it. Um, back in 2014, I had never been a mixologist. I had never been a bartender. I'd never served a drink behind a bar in any capacity. But I had a real love for food science. Um, I was a big fan of trigeminal effects. And I had been running my own sort of little business on the side, uh, teaching little kids how to make uh, butter from scratch and pasta from scratch with science. And then at the behest of a bunch of people who had taken classes for me, they said, have you ever made a cocktail? You should enter this national cocktail competition. It was open to amateurs and pros. I entered, and then as the one of the amateurs in the competition, I didn't just win the first top 12. I got whittled down to the top 12, went to New York, competed in one first place in the entire United States. And I just rode the wave. I got sent to Italy. I studied under some of the best mixologists in Italy. And then I came back and I worked for Koval Distillery and I worked for Reinhold Distillery. And the next thing I know, I launched Hollow Leg and I'm a huge fan of science. And Scott, like, I just want to preface this by saying, like, I think you've probably been to a mixology class before. And um, if you can notice, I don't look anything like your regular mixologist. I am like a bouncy blonde. There's no like tattoo that like sleeves up on here. No suspender straps, you know what I'm saying? Like no ironic facial hair. Like I did not look like what was kind of churned out as the regular bartender or mixologist. Um, but I have this huge, big love for science. And so with Julia childlike conviction, I really wanted to tackle all things cocktails with no pretension, with a lot of science, and with just a lot of pep and excitement. Because why not? Cocktails are fun. They should be fun, right? <laughs> I totally agree. I love your energy. It's infectious. Uh, I'm excited. I know we have a, a lot of folks tuning in today. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Or if you're watching the recording of this, um, you're really in for a treat today. And, uh, you know, you mentioned going to Italy or studying internationally. I was kind of curious what cocktail culture is like across the pond. 
Oh my goodness, it is wild and crazy and lovely. So it depends on where you're going. Um, I'm a dual citizen of the United Kingdom and the United States. So I'm half English and I'm half American, two passports. So um, in England, specifically in London, you just get such gorgeous presentation. And there's a lot of people who are really leading that sort of science charge. Um, they're focused more on the entire sensory, like ability to taste, smell, to feel cocktails. What do they look like? Um, there's some really cool like sensory projects that have been going on things like the Barclay in London, um, which is an incredible hotel that's got a blue room. Um, there's places in Italy, which Italy is much more I would say they're less refined, but they really have nailed down bitter cocktails. So they're famous for Amaro's, for like espresso martinis, for all these things that are like the spritz and have all these lovely bitter notes. And instead of being super refined, they're just, they're more honed into the classics, which is really nice. And their takes on American classics are lovely. It depends though, because I studied in Japan as well, and the Japanese have got their finger on the pulse of mixology. They are absolutely stunning some of the most incredible sort of magic tricks coming out of japan with uh changing color of cocktails and gastronomical science so doing really fun things and it's like every bar there is the aviary which is like a really fun and fabulous bar here in the city of chicago where they do crazy mixology tricks <laughs> that's what japan is like it's wild it's crazy i love all three of those countries for their mixology presence that just sounds amazing and makes me uh, yearn to travel again when it is safe. Oh, one day, Scott. <laughs> right, that's right. But we can all get through this together, um, and that's yes. really, really what's uh, what's important. Now, uh, the, the the theme that I'm hearing resonate, and when we were putting this event together, you know, I asked you what category this fits in, and I immediately thought, oh, you know, chefs and food. But you said, you know what? No, this is science. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about like what is it about the science of mixology that really fascinates you. Oh my God, where do I even begin? Um, when I entered all of this industry, our industry just needs a change up because there's so many good people doing so many good things. But really what we've done is we've glorified the bartender to the point where we think that they are the person who knows best what we should be drinking as humans. And um, I don't agree with that. I believe that the best bartender is likely gonna be somebody like yourself being able to make drinks for yourself because everyone has a different palate. For example, Scott, okay, when I first entered this industry, every cocktail class looked exactly the same. So let's say that you and I were in a margarita making class and we were there and we were making margaritas and there was one recipe and it was called the best margarita which by the way there's no such thing as a best any cocktail because really it's how you like to taste it um let's say that the cocktail was too sour for me but it was too sweet for you there was no science as to how do you correct something gone awry in a cocktail like where does that come in and so um I really honed in and I started educating myself as well as taking classes with the Wine and Spirit Education Trust um, and going to reading a lot of white papers about neurogastronomical science, which includes things like trigeminal effects, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit, um, things like the sensory olfactory bulb, things like sweet, sour, salty, bitter umami, so all taste buds, and then figuring out how to be the best cocktail sherpa getting people to the top of cocktail mountains so if you make a cocktail today for example scott on screen with me whether it's got alcohol or not and you tell me it's completely nauseating horrifying just the worst thing you've ever put in your mouth i can lead you in the way because i'm kind of like the marie Kondo of cocktails right like um she loves a good mess I love a really bad cocktail because it gives us room to educate, learn, and really sort of have a launch pad for science and understanding why it is that that particular cocktail just does not fit with your palate and your tastes. I love science. And I am actually <laughs> planning to make probably the worst drink I've ever had. But we'll have some ingredients here. You can you can see the ginger ale off, co uh, off camera. Oh. Um, uh, speaking of which, um, you know, you have actually a special name for cocktails without alcohol. Can you tell us more yes. about that? Oh my gosh, so I might be one of the people who hates the most the words virgin and mocktail. So if you're listening out here and you've heard those words, like a mocktail, a virgin cocktail, 
Scott, we're not 12 years old anymore. There's nothing sexy about going to a bar as like my age and ordering a mocktail or an, a virgin cocktail. What I like to call them is no proof. Um, so alcohol has proof in it. So you've got like a proof of alcohol and these have absolutely none. And no proof I think is sort of, it reclaims the dignity and the self-respect that should go along with non-alcoholic cocktails. Because here's the thing, if you don't want to drink, and you don't wanna have alcohol for whatever reason you don't wanna have alcohol. This is not a point of shame. This is actually kind of cool because what we can do is leverage science called specifically trigeminal effects and we can really figure out what we need to do to make those cocktails chemically uh, exciting in your mouth. Like there's a party in your mouth and everyone's invited, um, which is really the whole goal of a cocktail to begin with because when we're working with the base ingredient if you are making with alcohol, which is just any type of booze, you're getting the ethanol sting of alcohol. And this is a, Scott, I'm sure you've done this before. Have you ever taken one of those shots and done one of those little shimmies? Oh, you know what I'm saying? Like you shimmied it down because it was just stung the back of your throat. If not, then I challenge you to Malort, Scott. It's <laughs> just a very oh, Chicago thing. <laughs> I've, done it. I've done it and I'm not ashamed to admit it in front of the whole audience. Really? I love that. I love it. And guys, if you've ever done that little shimmy or if you've ever had a whiskey and it's burned the back of your mouth, this is actually a trigeminal effect. It's the sting of alcohol being picked up by your nerve endings in your mouth. And this is actually detecting all chemical sensations. So um, if you guys have ever tried to take a cup of hot coffee in the morning and you start to take your first sip, but you stop yourself because it's super hot, the trigeminal nerve is actually the thing that distinguishes between hot and cold. So it's actually your nerve endings things that are warning you, hey, this is going to burn you and you should stop yourself. But alcohol, temperature, those are only two trigeminal effects. Scott, there's like a plethora. For example, um, cooling effect of menthols. When you brush your teeth at night and you feel so fresh and so clean, clean, that's trigeminal effect of the cooling effect of the menthol. If you've got something like the pungency of garlic or ginger, or um, that sort of mouth clearing effect that you get with the nasal passages with English mustard, wasabi, um, mouth numbing effect of clove, of Sichuan peppers, things like the bubbles and carbon dioxide, the reason you're able to taste that bubbleage is because of course all of your nerve endings, and if you didn't have it, everything would taste flat and that think about this Scott a beer forevermore would be warm and flat if you didn't have trigeminal nerves or they were damaged because you would never be able to taste those things it's a fate worse than death even if you don't have alcohol there's so many other trigeminal effects that you can really dip into science wise to make interesting no proof cocktails and that's what we're also going to be touching on today all right. See, that's fascinating. I didn't know any of this stuff. So, you know, so hollow leg, you know, you've told us your background where you've studied uh, sort of this evolution iteration went with the flow. But what is what is the origin story of hollow leg? Oh, my goodness. So when I got back from Italy and um, worked with Koval and Reinhold Distilleries, whom I love, um, I ended up uh, leaving in 2015 and started going around to every cocktail class in the city. Because honestly, I wanted to see what was going on, right? Like what was being taught. And most classes were so boring and they were really bad. They were like sponsored by some sort of, I don't know, big uh, brand. They were usually very, very um, pretentious, hoity-toity. You would walk in, everybody would like walk in and sit down. There would be like a little set in front of you with all of your ingredients and you would just, you know, put together the exact same thing as your neighbor. If you tried it and you're like, mm, it's okay. There was usually no hows or whys and how to fix it. And then I just didn't like the fact that nobody looked like me. It was all, it was all those ironic facial hair dudes who were really, really like the demigods of the cocktail world. Um, and I wanted to know about the science of it. I really wanted to dig in and be like, okay, why is this particular thing? What is the enemy of bitterness if a, a cocktail is too bitter? Why, why is this particular sensation in my mouth, you know, firing off more than something else? Like, what are these flavor ratios? What does olfactory bulb and smell have to do with it? And so, as I was thinking about the name of my company, which is of course Hollow Leg, um, I was thinking, okay, one thing I'm noticing in most every single bar is that when you've got a six ounce cocktail, they're only putting one ounce of alcohol instead of two, which, you know, I'm a big fan of the rule of thirds. So for having a six ounce cocktail, one third water in the form of ice, because 
If you'll hear me wax poetic later, I love water in the form of ice. It's the most important part about mixology for dilution and temperature. And then of course you've got one third is gonna be booze in our cocktails and one third is mixers. And this way we're keeping that trigeminal effectiveness equal. We're getting a good temperature balance with dilution. We're getting a great ethanol balance with the alcohol. So instead of one alcoholic uh, shot, we're putting in two. And then of course we've got all the mixers which are a great base. And I, I really wanted to start on that sort of streamlined way of looking at things and then build on it. And I just love watching humans in my class create because as adults and Scott, we find ourselves there so often not, we just don't have enough to do with our hands these days, right? Unless, just, unless it's like a home improvement project that you're like digging in on. Um, most of those like Pinterest projects that you tried to find are probably flam flamed out by now. So this is great for people to get in. They treat my classes like a liquor lab and they can really explore things they would never normally put together. And that's, what I love, I like watching people light up like a little Christmas tree because they're excited about something they created. It's the best whiskey talk cocktail they've ever had and they made it with their own two hands. That's that's darn amazing. I like think of Julia Child every time someone comes up to me and says something like that. Incredible. And so you've dropped a few hints and uh, dropped some science as well, but what would you say is really the secret behind creating the perfect cocktail? I'm like reaching out of frame just so I can open my freezer and make sure that everybody sees what I'm going to grab because it's the magic bowl of ice. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I would literally, I would fight anybody on this. I'd fight anybody on this. I believe that water is the, the biggest, most important part. Obviously, right now we're in the summer. I'm not going to be drinking a hot toddy, but I would think that um, dilution and temperature are literally the most important parts about mixology. And just hear me out because I know it sounds really ridiculous, but think of it this way. If you're making a no proof cocktail, well, alcohol is not gonna be the most important part. And remember mixology is the study of the science of drinks. So it doesn't matter if it has alcohol in it or not. It's important to really make sure that alcohol is only secondary when it comes to cocktails, but temperature and dilution are so incredibly important. First of all, Scott, fun fact, we didn't even have cocktails until the turn of the century when the ice trade was made popular. So before that, it was a lot of just straight alcohols. And then we got to have dilution changes. We got temperature changes and the cocktail was born. And so if you think of it this way, dilution, number one, uh, one third of every cocktail is water in the form of ice. And it's because you want to take these sort of harsher ingredients and you want to really smooth the edges down. So instead of just taking shots, which you can do and more than likely you probably have done, but instead of taking shots, we can smooth that ethanol sting and really make it something that's drinkable for a larger drink and for a longer period of time. But temperature is so ridiculously important for two reasons. Number one, if you guys have walked into a bar and I want you to remember back to those days, you went to something called a bar. Do you remember that? Kind of, do you remember the bar, the ye old bar? Yes, I remember. I, they were crowded. It's a very big memory. Yes, they were. They were very crowded. They were crowded. It was insane. It was insane. So at the ye old bar that we went to, you know, pre-March, um, you guys probably remember when you walked in, you either ordered a hot cocktail, like a hot toddy, right, or a cold cocktail. There's no cocktails that really center on in the middle. They're not lukewarm. They're not room temperature. It ain't a glass of red wine, people. We're like looking at temperature changes. And this is important because of the science of how things play in our mouth. Um, for example, Scott, do you like uh, ice cream? Do you like sorbet? Do you like gelato? Do you like popsicles? Do you like any of those frozen sweet treats? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> So you're not discriminating. I love it. Um, if any of you guys love ice cream or popsicles out there, then what you'll notice is there's a heck of a lot of sugar in those things. Um, and it's not just because we want to have like a sugary ice cream, but if you think about it, it's because the little receptors on our tongue that pick up the flavor of sweet can actually not detect sweetness if a product is too cold. Mm. Thus, the colder the product is, the more sugar it also has to have in order for it to taste sweet when it hits your tongue. Um, this is because our mouth likes to break down sugar molecules with heat, and that's how we're able to perceive any type of sweetness. So in a hot cocktail, we'd actually put less sugar 
because of course it's a warmer temperature. We can perceive the sweetness more. And in a cold cocktail, we need a little bit more sugar because of course it's going to be freezing cold and we want it to break down in our mouth in a way that is pleasing to our palate. So temperature is super important because of course we want to make sure that we are making something balanced. We don't want to go over the top. And we also want to just make sure that we've got the right sort of uh, chemical sensation in our mouth. Think of a Moscow mule. Moscow meals are super cold. They're kept in those little copper mugs, Scott, for a reason, to keep them as cold as humanly possible. How much science do you want? I could talk about it. How many hours do we have on this? Oh, this is good. Yeah. Where, where, where for the hours? So, uh, so that's it. <laughs> you know, um, what would you like to teach us today? You've got a, a great audience here. I've got some ingredients off camera um, and on camera in some cases. <laughs> I, I, I want to you know, kind of find out from you, what, uh, what, what can you impart on us today? I am so excited because I want to give you guys one of my favorite cocktails. It's, um, it's a really interesting way to talk about science. And I know that it's not the fanciest cocktail. Remember, there's no pretension in what I do. So I never judge if somebody just wants a vodka cranberry. There's a lot of science that goes behind those as well. And I don't judge people if they want something that's a super difficult, completely ridiculous Manhattan or something weird that's got a bunch of random ingredients. However, I think the most important thing is to start with a nice baseline for anybody who wants to know. This is great for beginners. It's great for those of you who have like studied a lot about mixology and know a lot about combinations. But we're going to talk a little bit about the science of this particular cocktail. All right. So, Scott, I love to talk about first the liquor that we're going to put in this one. And I know you're going to make a no-proof cocktail, which I'm really excited about. I'm also going to show people how they can uh, make this particular cocktail something not no-proof. Um, I wanted to add gin in this because I'm a firm believer that if you uh, do not like gin, you've probably not found the right style of gin for you. Uh, generally, we talk about gins as being juniper forward. Um, that is any type of gin that's got a really high concentration of juniper berry. They taste very classic. They sometimes have that medicinal and piney flavor that a lot of people will say oh I hate that but there's another style of gin and um, it's a contemporary style it's got less concentration of juniper berry in it um, this particular one is just a Fleischmann's I know I'm sure people are like that's not a sexy bottle of gin it's one that comes from the bottom shelves and it's in plastic but guys it is absolutely phenomenal it's got a lovely coriander brightness to it it's great for mixing remember a lot of those juniper forward gins those really complex lovely gins scott they're not meant to have a ton of other ingredients stacked on top of them. They're meant to be tasted like the distiller made them, right? So you can taste the nuance in the bottle with say a little bit of tonic water and a little splash of lime, not really supposed to be layered with a bunch of ingredients. But this one, it's gonna be nice and it's gonna be contemporary. And I want you guys to remember, we're putting in two shots of alcohol, two full ounces in every <laughs> single cocktail. I know it seems like a lot of stuff, but you know, why not, right? It's, it's, what day is it? It's Wednesday. What? During these times, I don't even know. Tuesday. It's Tuesday. It? Let's go with that. I love, whatever day it is, guys. I've lost all sense of time. Um, Scott, also, I just want to point out that I know people are going to totally judge because people immediately look at your bar tools and they're like, that's not a real mixologist. They're not using the proper bar tools. This is a ball jar. I love these. I'm like in love with ball jar. Uh, Bulger is made in the United States of America. <laughs> Go get it. Um, but also, if you can see this, this does not look like your regular barware. And I purposely use this because it's not your regular barware. It is superior to your regular barware. This stuff is glass. Um, it is lovely because I can see my color, my clarity. I can see aeration in the glass when I'm shaking, so I know what I'm really getting. Um, I love it because if you have no other measuring tools in your entire house, note, all of the measurings are right literally along the sides. So you can see in ounces on one side, and then you can see on milliliters in the other. So Scott, just in case you like got a foreigner, like you're dating a foreigner, you are a foreigner, no excuses. You can literally get busy in the kitchen with one tool. Um, I always like to joke that much like uh, you guys, when you get drunk, all of these tops also easily come off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Scott? And uh, I love these also because all of my standard barware, this is just a Hawthorne strainer, fit like a match made in mixology heaven right in the top so it's literally like it was meant to be for this particular purpose um, the first thing I'm going to do though is we're always going to do ice last so ice is never going to be first it's always going to be last I'm just going to add two full ounces of alcohol and just using the side 
of this little jar because I can see the two ounce mark and I just want to make sure I'm getting up to the two. And where is the two? There it is. Uh, and then what I want to do is I want to talk about proportions. So when you're building an amazing cocktail, Scott, you need to have things balanced. Think of it like your Instagram photos, right? Like everything's in like the rule of thirds and we wanna make sure that we've got some really lovely balance. We don't want anything to be too strong in the cocktail. We want everything to kind of interplay. We want some specificity. So we need to taste certain ingredients and be able to taste this specifically. But we also want like the je ne sais quoi, right? We want that undercurrent of flavor. We want it to like draw you in. We want the chemical sensations and we want on the palate sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, if we're any, using any of those to be completely balanced in the balance. So the first thing I like to think of with this particular cocktail is what's called a naturally sweet mixer. These mixers, guys, super easy to find around your house. These are things like orange juice, right? That's got natural sugar in it. You're not adding any extra sugar. Things like uh, cherry juice, apple cider, things like um, pineapple juice, and the one that I'm using today, which is pomegranate juice. So pomegranate juice is lovely, it's earthy, it's a little bit more deep, it's a little bit more complex, it's giving us a little bit more, and I'm only gonna add an ounce. So when you're making this at home, you want to think about your naturally sweet mixer, whether it be pineapple or orange, whether it be mango or pomegranate, you're looking for about an ounce. Remember that we're thinking about the proportions of uh, the cocktail, six ounces, and the first thing we want is we want the two ounces of alcohol, and now we're building two full ounces of mixers. So you're going to watch how this just changes the color, I mean, just instantly. And always, guys, use your sense of smell. Every single ingredient you put in, you should be smelling everything that you put in. Because what you want to do is you want to take your nose on a journey. Think about it this way. You want to make sure that you're watching the evolution of your cocktail. Scott, did you know that your strongest sense as a human being is your sense of smell? I learned that from you, actually. Oh, what? <laughs> I did not know that before. It's insane. I really, we're, we're just the animals, and most the animals, their sense of smell is the strongest. Ours is quite weak compared to other animals, but um, I just want you to always smell. So even when you're making your no proof, I want you to really just give it a, a quick sniff and try and see if you can really put your finger on the ingredients you're adding. Now, guys. We don't stop there. We're thinking about layering flavors. So Scott, I want to talk to you about a concept about being basic. Have you ever heard about the hashtag basic? Like, so basic. I'm extraordinary. Cool. <laughs> you, you don't see basic at all to me. There's like literally nothing about you basic. I don't even know, like, I don't know what's behind you on the wall. I was like trying to make out. I was like, is that Capri? Like, or is that an Italian photo? Where is that? Close, yeah, that's from Greece. Those are some photos from when I got married. Oh. Oh, see, you're not basic. You're just a sweet guy with some pictures of your wedding from behind you. That's really sweet. He's a good guy. Kudos, kudos to your wife. Um, she picked a good one. So, all right, let's just talk about this. I'm not basic. You're not basic. Nobody wants to be basic. It's not like we're all like, oh, I really hope I can be basic today. I'm really boring. Um, this next particular category of mixers is really what's going to give you more depth more complexity. We're talking about not being basic and we're talking about bitter, acidic, and astringent mixers. I'm gonna get serious while I talk about these, which is a very rare moment. Guys, bitterness. Bitterness is something that we can taste on our taste buds. Bitterness um, is incredible for cocktails, but you have to be balanced. Bitterness comes from things like coffee, Things like tea, the polyphenols and tea is really what leads to that bitter flavor. Um, we've got things that are a little bit more acidic. So acidic or sour notes. If anybody likes Warheads from the 1990s or like love Sour Patch Kids, you'll remember that when you put one of those in your mouth, your mouth would pucker and then it would water. Do you remember that? Oh Fantastic, yeah. Fantastic, Scott, I love that feeling. Um, if your mouth is watering and your saliva glands are really being interacted, then that's actually a mark of acidity. It's a mark of sourness. But there's another little word in there called astringency. And astringency is really interesting and it's often overlooked. Astringency is a drying effect in the mouth. It's literally when your taste buds contract. And it's, it, it causes this thing we call it like cotton mouth feel. This kind of occurs in things like um, grapefruit juice. It also can occur in things like black coffee with nothing in it or with an oversteeped cup of tea. As a matter of fact, Scott, I know that you've got a cup of tea on you. I do. Do you mind just giving it like a tiny taste? 
Yeah. So I should I, give that a tiny taste. Go ahead. All I have left is the tea bag, actually. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So what I did was I had pre-steeped this tea bag, and then I just uh, I just left it. <laughs> I'm not sure I what I did all the instructions, did I? <laughs> no, did you did you leave the water in there? Is there water in that tea? No water left, it's just the tea bag. <laughs> did you pre-drink the cup of tea? He really I, needed I, it, guys. I, I, I just spilled it out. <laughs> I thought all I needed was the tea bag. <laughs> That's actually really cute. That's really cute. Keep the tea bag. Keep okay. the tea bag. Um, you're gonna do me a favor. Um, do you see the ginger? Actually, get that spiced tonic out. That spiced tonic stuff that you've got. Right here. <laughs> Beautiful. Can you pour that over the tea bag? Sure. Not the whole thing. Pour about like mm, pour about like an ounce over the tea bag. Sure. I'll tell you when. Okay. I'm watching your screen. Beautiful. Stop there. Let that soak in that tea bag for a while. All right. Now here's the thing, guys. If Scott had tasted that tea. <laughs> If he had tasted it, then he probably would have found that after a while he got this cotton mouth feel on his mouth. Um, polyphenols, in addition to being bittering, also have an astringency factor. What it does is it's actually taking water away from your mouth. It's, it's making that drying effect. The beautiful part about cocktails is that you can play with mouth feel, which is just a scientific term for texture inside of your mouth, by either making something that's more of an acidic cocktail, which is actually gonna make your saliva glands go and a little bit more watery, or you can make it a little bit more dry, astringent, like a glass of red wine would, and th that sort of cotton mouth feel. So in this particular cocktail, I wanna keep things dry, Scott. So I've got this lovely pomegranate juice, it's very earthy, and now I'm going to add grapefruit juice. And I'm gonna add this in a um, one to half ratio. So one ounce of my pomegranate, half of an ounce of my grapefruit juice. And um, I've got these fun little measuring cups here because mm, I don't have proper barware because I've never been a bartender. And that's not my MO. So now I'm adding this in. It's only a half an ounce of grapefruit juice. And when I smell this, Scott, Instead of just being like that sweetness of the pomegranate juice and the gin, what I'm getting now is I'm getting more of those astringent notes. If I just take the sip, a sip of this right now, I'm getting more of that dimension in the grapefruit. You know, grapefruit juice has a certain like um, puckering note to it, but it's got a lovely uh, aromatic to it as well. And now we have to think sugar. Now, Scott, I get a lot of people to tell me they do not like sugar in their cocktails. Are you one of those people? Probably, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A lot of people, especially dudes, I get a lot of dudes who are like, I do not like sugar in my cocktails. Do you like, do you ever drink old fashions? Oh, sure. Oh my gosh. Old fashions have so much sugar in them. They're, <laughs> they're pretty high on the bricks level. They're, um, they're fantastic drinks. I love them. But um, if you ever hear a person who does not like sugar in their cocktails, but they love old fashions, that's just, a, it's a sugary cocktail that's very well balanced with the amount of bitterness and dilution that they have. So. Let's think of sugar. Guys, there's a million different types of sugars. I've written, I wrote a whole blog on like an encyclopedia of sugars that you can usually like work with things like sorghum and molasses, things like um, honey, which would get a more floral note, things like demerara sugar, which have got more of those like burnt caramel, like molasses notes. You can use things like agave. You can use anything. This particular one is super simple. It's one I use all the time, which is why there's such a left in the bottle. It's, um, it's just plain old simple syrup. Simple syrup is just white sugar and water married together um, at equal volumes. So I always do my measure, my kitchen little uh, scale, and then I measure by the volume. Now, for a cocktail with six ounces, you only want two teaspoons. I know that sounds like not a lot, but it's really, it really is just a tiny amount of sugar. And there's two things that we're trying to accomplish, Scott. Number one, so have you ever been to a, um, a bar? and you get a cocktail that's super watery, it doesn't taste like it's really got any grip in your mouth, it just sort of slides down like a glass of water would. Oh yeah. Um, we need texture, we need that mouth feel. We need something that's got a little bit more viscosity, a little bit more thickness in the glass. The sugar is accomplishing that, it's a little bit more viscous. We're also getting a little bit of extra dilution in there, and of course, we're getting sugar, which uh, we need because when we bring the temperature of this cocktail down and we, we dilute it, we don't want it to taste bland, right? We want to make sure that it's got that amount of sweetness in it to deliver the other flavors. So I'm going to give it another smell. Sweetness is a little bit harder to detect on your nose. So when you smell, it's going to be a little bit harder. But you can also get a taste at this point. Mm. And Scott, the best thing I can tell anybody is if you want 
add smaller amounts of sugar, and then you can continue to add more sugar as you go. Remember, we're budding mixologists, but not all of us are budding magicians, which means we can add things into our cocktail. Very hard to take them away, you guys. So make sure that you're sticking things in your glass in small conservative amounts so you can build up later. And I like to do this as well, Scott, and we're gonna have you try your cocktail in a second and make sure. But um, your cocktail should be slightly sweeter than what you would normally drink when it's at room temperature. Because if it's slightly sweeter, and then we add that ice, bring the temperature down, dilute it, it will be the perfect sweetness level for us once we've got that particular step. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add something that's got acidity in it. Now, you don't have to do this step, but for me, I really like that balance of acid in there. Remember, grapefruit juice doesn't have the amount of acid that we really need, so um, I'm going to add in a lemon. Now, I really like to talk about uh, this particular part, Scott. You've heard me talk about this before. Uh, I feel like, Right now, I'm the secondary character. Uh, the leading lady is gonna be the lemon. Guys, humans are a lot like citrus fruit. Roll with me on this one. We all look very different on the outside, but we're all the same on the inside. You know what I'm saying? It's poetry in the making. Scott, this is the inside of a lemon. I'm sure you've seen the inside of a lemon before, but let's just give you a quick citric anatomy lesson. The first part that we've got, of course, is going to be the inside, which is the pulp. This has got a lot of the citric acid and the water content. Now you could just squeeze this in if you wanted, but you'd be missing out, Scott, and all the goodness that's inside the rest of this fruit. This white section here, which goes all the way around the fruit, is called the pith, P-I-T-H. It has bitter oils and compounds in it. And of course, it's got that lovely bitter flavor. You guys will know this if you've ever had an orange wedge when you were a kid and you avoided eating those like bitter white parts. And then of course, we've got the peel. And the peel has all of that oil, that citric oil that of course lends itself to the aromatics of the drink. Remember, smell is super important. And because those oils are less dense than the water below them, they'll float to the top, which is awesome, giving you that really lovely nose. So we've got this guy here. And what I want to do is I just want to make a quick cut. I'm going to just bring it on over to my cutting board here, and I'm going to cut it into fours. Beautiful. And I'm just going to toss him into my glass. I'm not going to squeeze him. I'm just tossing him. Because the next thing I want to do is I want to add something that's trigeminally effective. Remember, guys, we're talking about trigeminal effects. Party in your mouth. Everyone's invited. Every cocktail should do this for you. Every single one. Um, if it doesn't, if you take the sip of a cocktail and you have to turn to your friend at the bar and say, is there any alcohol in yours? Because I can't taste any alcohol in mine. Or if you're given a no-proof cocktail and it tastes like a glorified juice drink, they're doing it wrong. You need something that is going to make all of your nerve endings fire. This is like what cocktails are about. This is the crux of mixology, temperature dilution, and then of course we've got trigeminal effects. And one of the two things that you could be using is you could use a jalapeno. So I was actually using jalapenos earlier in a cocktail, and um, Scott, this is hot. There's capsation oil in this particular guy. When you add him in, he's got that heat, and the heat of capsation is picked up by your trigeminal nervous endings. So we've got this guy here, or if you didn't like any type of jalapeno, and you have ginger, this is lovely because it's fresh ginger, which is going to be that pungency that you get in the back of your mouth, and we really want to make sure it's going to sing. I'm, for this particular purpose, going to use ginger. Um, I'm going to cut quite a large piece off for my cocktail, so it's looking quite big. And I'm going to just sit them boom, boom, right on into the glass. Now, the fun part. You didn't think you were going to get a workout, did you, Scott? <laughs> I was not expecting the jalapeno, to be honest. <laughs> oh my gosh, the jalapeno is fantastic in this cocktail. Um, all right, so when you guys are ready, remember, we don't just want to squeeze that lemon in. We want to, we want to mash everything in. It's called muddling. So we've got our muddler out here. And um, I'm just going to show you guys how I like to muddle. I think it's like the, for me, the best way. It's Remember, I'm not like one of these flair bartenders. I, I just really love the idea of joints and science and body science. I always grab my tool away from me, I put it out to my side, I lower my arm and do a 90 degree angle, put my middle finger down. And um, I like to think about my 20s, Scott, when I used to order Ikea furniture, do you remember that? Of course. Fantastic, we, don't, we all have muscle memory from Ikea furniture. Guys, I want you to screw in your Ikea furniture chair. You're going to push down, screw in. 
push down, screw in, really just like that. It's how you're doing it. And what you really want to do is you want to kind of Hulk smash some of the ginger in there. You're looking to really push down evenly on that lemon. You're trying to get that oil out. You're getting all those notes. And when you're done, you give it a smell. And the two things I can smell, Scott, it's pretty magical. I can smell the citric acid. So immediately, like, extra brightness from the acidity in this drink. And then when I really, like, put my nose into it, harder to get with my nose at this point, but I bet if I tasted it, I'm going to be tasting a lot of that ginger. I want that pungency in there. So, guys, now we're not in basic territory. <laughs> we're not hashtag basic anymore. Now we've got layers of flavors. We've got the mouthfeel and the drying effect of that grapefruit juice. We've got the earthiness of pomegranate. We've got that lovely pungency of the ginger. We've got a little bit of acidity in those oils, which is really giving it a lot of aromatics. We've got a little bit of sugar to balance everything out. And now what do we do? We grab some ice. Oh, yeah. I love ice. <laughs> love ice. I'm not going to add a ton, though. Scott, because there isn't, you can't over dilute a cocktail. You can't put too much ice in something and make it really watery. But um, for this particular one, I'm looking for about two fluid ounces of ice, which if you're using one of these ball jars or if you've got a measurement, you can see I brought it up to the six ounce mark just around here. There we go. So you've got two ounces of booze, two ounces of mixers, and of course the two ounces of here. And I screw it on. And this is the fun part because it really is a workout for anybody who like has missed the gym for the last like three months, then this is really, I mean, as long as you get into mixology, you're pretty much made of the shade. You've got like a full body workout. We're gonna shake from up and down, to side to side. And while we do this, Scott, for 12 full seconds, you're gonna watch me work on my shake face. Oh Notice I don't wanna look constipated or angry with my shake face. I wanna make sure I look like I'm having a good time. Make sure I've really got this going on. And notice how I'm covering the entire surface area of the ice with the liquid. Really up, down, side to side. You can feel it in your arms. And now we've got our little guy. You can see some aeration from the bubbles in the side. The color is really pretty. And now the only thing I can tell people to do on camera, take its top off. Take your tops off, people, when you've got one of these. And now we're going to strain it. Now... Scott, I like to strain mine. I always tell people, don't put your alcohol in the freezer. Put your glassware in the freezer. Mm. I'm a big fan of freezing my glassware because it just keeps things cold. It's lovely. I do have one large ice cube in there because why not? Let's get fancy with it. And I'm just going to pour like I'm Tom Cruise from the movie Cocktail. You know what I'm saying? Like from low to high so it gets some more aeration in the glass. So I just want to make sure I'm doing this. Do not worry, guys, if you spill on the floor. <laughs> Nobody's around in your home anyway to watch you. So you can just do whatever you like. And now we're going to do two things. First, we're going to smell it and taste it, obviously. Oh, I can smell the ginger now. The dilution really brings out the ginger. Mm. Oh, and it's lovely. And if you hate it, then it's, not, it's all good. Because if this was too sweet for you, what we would do is we'd just grab a little wedge of lemon, and we could just add that in to curb the sweetness. Done. So if that was the problem, then you could do that. However, there's something special and extra I like to do. Scott, I think you know where I'm about to go. Oh yeah. I'm a big fan of bitters. Yes. Bitters and tinctures. I um, make all of them myself. So all the ones that we use at Hololag, we make ourselves. And um, I've got so many like different varieties of them that I love. Um, but I was thinking about your cup of tea earlier and I thought, oh, I wonder if Earl Grey would go really well. I've got ginger in there, I've got lemon in there, I've got this pomegranate, adding a more of that Earl Grey, that bergamot note in the bottom, which would be really lovely. So I was like, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. And what bitters and tinctures are, if you've never heard of them before, is I call them the condiments of the cocktail world. So they're fantastic. What you can do is layer them. And um, they're usually made from alcohol as the main solvent. So if you guys remember back to like seventh grade science, you'll probably remember that your teacher talked about solvents. And a solvent is really any chemical or anything that can dissolve one thing from itself into another. So um, I like to make the reference to Breaking Bad. If you remember, have you ever watched Breaking Bad, Scott? Of course, that's one of my favorite shows of all time. <laughs> Such a good show. Do you remember, I think it was season, I think it was season one, like pretty like deep in, when um, Jesse was trying to melt the body in the bathtub? Oh yeah. 
and they used the acid and they could like hear the like bathtub like rumbling and it fell through the floor because the the acid is a solvent and it just literally dissolved everything it touched and then like broke everything that's what solvents do um seventh grade science would have been so much cooler had like breaking bad been shown and we could like have learned those but probably not appropriate for children so okay we've got solvents vinegar is a solvent Mm. We've got acid as a solvent, alcohol as a solvent. These are some main solvents. And what I'm doing is I take alcohol, usually at 75.5% ABV, just to illustrate all the alcohol that I would be using in classes, like a 40% ABV. And then what we do is we add that into a particular ingredient and let it sit like you would that tea bag, Scott. And then what it happens is it actually dissolves flavor molecules from whatever I put in. And then when I take it out, it takes on the flavor. So this is just alcohol and Earl Grey loose leaf tea. And then when I strain it off, it tastes like really alcoholic Earl Grey loose leaf tea, which is really lovely. Um, but because it's so high in alcoholic volume, it's concentrated. I don't need a whole lot of it. It really adds to the aromatics of the drink, which is nice. And it adds that je ne sais quoi. That X factor, that like reason that you want to keep sipping in the cocktail. I make a million different flavors from like cinnamon to toasted pecan. Earl Grey is this one. The way that we're adding this, I'm just going to like give you guys a close up, is we're literally taking my bitters. I've got a cap full just like this, and I'm going to make it rain all over the surface area. I'm being very like egalitarian. I'm not just putting in one area. I'm sticking it all over, and then you've got it. And then we want to do a smell. Ooh, I can smell that Earl Grey off the top. And then we give it a taste. And I'm not saying that's one of my favorite cocktails that I've ever made in my life, but this is my favorite cocktail I've ever made in my life. I love the pomegranate grapefruit combination. I think it's so classic. It's so lovely. It teaches so much science with such a little, small amount of drinks. All right, Scott, you look thirsty. Do you want me to walk you through yours? I am ready. <laughs> All right, Scott. The first thing I need you to do is you've got a lemon over there. Do you not? Yay. Yay. He's got a half a lemon. I sure do. Okay. Do you have any type of shaker, something you could put ice in? Um, no. I have a glass and I have an ice bucket. I love that. Fantastic. All right. You're going to squeeze that entire lemon into that glass. Oh, great. Do it. Everyone's going to see me do it. Right now, guys, here's the cool part. You can follow along literally with any ingredients you find in your kitchen. You can like throw something up in the private chat over there or the, wherever the chat is. And you can actually ask me, hey, I've got X and I've got Y. If you've got orange juice sitting in your fridge and you've got old coffee that was brewing this morning and you have whiskey, you can literally make one of the best cocktails in the entire world. Orange juice, coffee, whiskey, and sugar are fabulous. Oh my gosh, that looks like a lot of lemon juice. That's fantastic. All right. Um, I know this is going to be kind of a shock, Scott, but could you, for just posterity's sake, give it a little sip so we can like smell it and you're going to give it a little tiny taste. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Where's my drink? Mm, that's not bad. Really tart. Really tart, right? Yes. Fabulous. Okay. Now you've got that tonic syrup. I do. Now we were talking about the ingredients in that tonic syrup earlier. Mm. Get a quick view on the camera just so we can see what you're working with. Gorgeous, fantastic. A spiced tonic syrup has got a couple of things in it, guys, besides just the natural flavors, which we were trying to define if they were like more cinnamony and a little bit more on that spicy side. So we're thinking more fall spice. We can also notice it's got a bittering agent in there, um, which is fantastic. And then of course it's got sugar in there as well. Um, because we're making kind of a riff on yours, what I'm gonna have you do is you're going to add, you added that stuff to the tea bag. Do you remember that tea bag stuff? You're yeah. gonna dump all of that, so that full ounce into your lemon juice. Okay, great. All right, guys, think of it this way. We've got something that's gonna be like bitter and acidic, right? So the acidity is coming from the lemon juice. Now he's gonna be adding, of course, this lovely, oh yes, lots of sugar, bitterness from that syrup, as well as we've got more sugar on there. You're gonna give it a little swirl and just give it a quick taste. We're, remember, we're not quite, it's not gonna be quite as sweet as what it's gonna taste in your glass, mm. but we've got a lot of acidity right now. Already pretty good, right? Yes. Fantastic. Do you see how we've got all these proportions coming together? Okay, Scott. Now, we're working with some limited stuff over there. So um, I'm not going to like make you run to your pantry, but what I am going to see is you're going to put ice in this, and we're going to make a stirred drink. And I'm just going to talk to you about the difference between a stirred and a shaken drink. 
So when we shook my drink, Scott, you'll notice I really look for aeration. I look for bubbles. And usually if it's a cream-based drink, if it's a juice-based drink, if it's got an egg white in it, we want it to be all aerated because we want it fluffy. We want it to be nice and like expanded in your mouth. But yours is going to be a stirred drink. So with a stirred drink, what it really does is, number one, it doesn't bring the temperature quite as low. So you're not going to have quite as low of a temperature in your cocktail. But also what it's going to do is it's not going to have quite as much dilution. So it's going to be a little bit more on the viscous side, which is nice because we're not adding a whole lot of alcohol. Um, I just want to make sure that we're keeping that drink quite like thick. So what we're going to do is you're going to grab that ice. You're going to grab a couple of different ones. And I would just want you to stir it. Now, you can stir it with your finger if you like. No, guys, do not think you need like fancy bar tools to be a good mixologist. I've seen uh, if you can be the MacGyver of like mixology and like use stuff you can find around your house and like raid your pantry and then make something delicious, you're an incredible mixologist. Don't let anybody tell you differently. There's no, no suspender straps are needed in the making of a cocktail. All right, let's see you just give that a good stir, Scott. All right, I'm gonna watch, put my watchful eye. Little ice cube mm. here, and then uh, let's give it a good stir. Oh my gosh, beautiful! See how he's using his finger. That technique is beautiful. Keep on going. Now you're gonna like your finger is gonna go so numb because you're gonna be stirring that for about 20 seconds. Now I'm counting down in my head, so we've got about 12 and 11 and 10 and nine and eight. Yeah, your finger's getting cold, isn't it? Seven and yeah. six. You're gonna keep that ice in there, Scott. So don't like, take that ice out for now. Five, four. Three, two, one, boom, you're done. All right, <laughs> now you're gonna notice something, Scott, because you tried, tried this before you put this. Give it a smell, give it a sip, and now let's talk to me mm. about that amount of sugar. Do you taste the amount of sugar in there? A Pretty little. sugary? Yeah. A little bit. It's not crazy. The That's lemonade. what I wanna say. It's overpowering, yeah. It's almost like a flavored lemonade. That's yes. a bit more bitter. Right, so it's got that bitterness in there. Okay, now we're gonna be using that ginger ale. Okay. I spotted it. I spotted it in the back. He like put it, it was like, picture of where I got married. Beautiful grace and ginger ale in the background. There we go. <laughs> Okay, guys, real quick, you probably have had ginger ale before, but Scott, you know the difference between ginger ale and ginger beer, right? Yes. Fantastic. Guys, ginger beer, is a fermented drink that usually uses a lot of fresh ginger in the making. Ginger ale can either go one, rather than rather than a high amount of flavor of ginger. So you're getting a little bit of a different uh, taste to it. But really what we're using this for, Scott, is we're gonna use this for the dilution, and we're gonna use this for the trigeminal effect of the carbon dioxide. So open up that ginger ale, and what I want you to do, does it? Yeah. <gasps> I, I think it's because of those like the syrup that you use, that like bitter yeah. syrup. Now give it a taste. All right. What you'll notice, Scott, is really we're trying to make that chemical sensation of that CO2 be exciting on the mouth. Now, I'm a big fan of using trigeminal effects in pairs. So right now, if you say had, I don't know, a, a fresh piece of ginger, or if you had any herbs from the garden, I'm a big fan of herbs. If you had it, I would probably suggest something like basil. I love basil. Uh, this is purple. This is purple basil, and this is, of course, regular basil. And then these are very aromatic, and you can, like, slap them in and put them in. You can put in things like fresh mint on the top of that to really add to the aromatics of the drink. But what we're looking for is we don't want to be basic. So if you can only taste one or two ingredients, that's not a great cocktail. What I want to do is I want some specificity, but I also want you to be like, what is that flavor underneath? And I bet you the flavor that you're tasting underneath that je ne sais quoi is that bittering note of the, what was the bittering agent that was in that tonic? I'm going to make you say the word again. Not the lemon. <laughs> no, the, um, that syrup tonic. What was the bittering agent? Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, that's the word I didn't know, right? That was the, uh, let's get to it here. Is that the cinchona? Yeah, that's, that's what it is. Um, that's awesome. So that's that's that bittering note, guys. That's what's making his thing like a little bit more complex, that je ne sais quoi. If you don't have bitters, you can actually not, you don't have to make your own bitters or even buy bitters. What I would do is just what Scott did, which is either find a sy simple syrup that already has bitterness involved, or you can make your own. And Scott, it is so cheap and so easy to make your own simple syrups at home. All you need is equal amounts of that water and some sort of sugar. Mm. And then you can put in something like a cinnamon stick. 
And then you've got cinnamon flavored simple syrup. You could put in things like whole black peppercorns mm -hmm. and you can make something that's like a spicy sort of peppery note on the back end, which is really adding to bitterness. Um, you can make a ton of different ones. You can make basil simple syrup. You can make strawberry simple syrup. As long as you're using some sort of agricultural product, you can literally make anything into a simple syrup. And it's such an easy way to customize stuff and a great way to make no proof cocktails more interesting with flavor. And this is incredibly drinkable. Right? Well, you've got something there that's really interesting. I keep putting it on my thing. You can, you've got something that's super interesting because you just want to see about the building of flavor. And guys, this is where your kitchen is your best friend and really why you need to all thank goodness that you were at homes and stuck at home because you've got the ability to go through your pantry. So I'm not going to take you totally on a journey, but listen, Scott, I'm going to like, just note that I've got a little liquor cabinet over here. You can see I'm van wedding it. Um, guys, has anybody come to a, you've gone to a housewarming party. Somebody's been to your house for a housewarming party. Scott, had, did you have a housewarming party when you and your wife moved in together? We did, yes. And did somebody come to your party, I don't know, say a brother-in-law's second cousin's best friend and brought you, I don't know, a bottle of something horrifying that you were like, thank you so much. This is going to collect all the dust in the world and I'm never going to drink it. Um, you huh. might have one of those, right? Like some dusty bottle of, I don't know, Chinar or some dusty bottle of like Aperol that you were like, Ugh, what is this? I don't want to use it. Now is the time, guys, to be really going through your cabinet and finding weird ingredients and then experimenting with them. And that can even be weird ingredients like you bought nutmeg once from the store, a whole nutmeg. If you're like, what am I going to do with this? I tried to make a pumpkin pie once that totally failed. That's the best time to make. I want to see... If Scott, if anyone's got like random pictures, they can like find me on Instagram. They can like send me their stuff. I want to be people's cocktail Sherpa for life. Like I literally want all of your crappy combinations. I want your weird flavors. I want your like completely bombed failed cocktails because we can fix it. Scott, if that drink was horrifying, there is a way that we could have used even just stuff around your apartment to make it better. Like, I, like test me out, boy, because I can like I can make I'm like a cocktail whisperer over here. I can make anything taste good, like anything taste good. So Scott, do you have any burning mixology questions for me? Well, I'm wondering when you go to a bar, if there's a drink that is not to your liking, do you sneak a bitter and a tincture or something in your drink, or do your friends ask you to do that? Oh my gosh! So um. You know, I never, I never resonated more with a lyric from a song than when Beyonce sang, I've got hot sauce in my swag bag because she like, carries hot sauce with her. Yeah. Um, I always, I am such a nerd, I always have a couple of my bottles of bitters in my purse with me. And listen, there's some great bars that don't need any, you know, doing. But if I'm going out and I really find that the trigeminal effect, because our industry is not really prepping people with that particular level of science. So trigeminal effects are not really taught. If you ask people, they don't really know what they are. Um, and really what it comes down to is I want to make things more chemically effective and I want to make them exciting. So I always carry these, um, some sort of bitters. They change with the season, however I'm going, because A, it's going to add a little bit of extra alcoholic volume in case I got stiffed on the uh, amount of alcohol they put into my drink, but also because it's going to add aromatics, it's going to add bitterness, it's adding that je ne sais quoi that I love to talk about. But normally I go to bars that I really like or I make drinks at home. I would say this, if you're at a bar and you get served something horrifying, it's, it's okay to send it back. It's okay to be polite and talk about it and say, oh, it's just not what I like or what I ordered. But before you even get to that point, I'm gonna encourage everybody to be curious. If you read, because a lot of these cocktail menus, guys, and I've been in the industry for quite some time, so I know a lot of the alcohols out there, I know a lot of flavor pairings, but I can't know everything, right? Like, I, there's no way. Like, with the amount of stuff that's being produced and how things get churned out, anybody who thinks they know everything knows nothing because, frankly, it is an ever-changing topic and there's so much and it's so incredible. But I ask questions. I'll say, excuse me, I usually like sour cocktails with more of a floral note. I don't know what, like, half of these ingredients in the raw, raw, raw cocktail are. Is this, like, what I'm looking for? And what they can do is they can really steer you in the direction of something that you might like. If you do find something that's flawed about a cocktail, and this is usually on the front of the palate, so we've got something that's, like, it's too sweet, 
maybe it's too sour, maybe it's too bitter. These three things are very easy to correct because if it's too bitter or if it's too uh, sweet, you can use a little wedge of lemon or lime and you can just squeeze it in the cocktail and it's going to soften the perception of those two things. If it's going to be too sour, then what you can always do is ask for an extra splash of either club soda, increasing the dilution on it, or you can ask for something that's a little bit more like simple syrup so you can really increase the amount of sugar level. I am never offended in a class, not once, if I make something for somebody and they hate it. Because here's the thing, every person's palate is different. And what somebody else might love and nine people might love and the 10th person hates, that's not a reflection on my skills or anything else. It's just a reflection if I'm rude about it. The reflection is, can I use science and really in layman's terms, explain to this person, what is it that you don't like? How do we fix it? And how do we go forward and make all of these cocktails that are in that particular category something that you'd be willing to drink? And then you're off to the races. And that's, that's what I love about mixology. There's no mistakes in mixology. I am afraid that we are out of time. I'm sure I we know. all would love to stay. You were fantastic. Devin, where can we find you? How can people reach you? Oh, my goodness. You can find me on Instagram. Um, the easiest way is I've got my little sign, at hollow leg mixology, so just add the at sign to here. Um, but, goodness, I mean, my number is public. My... Everything is public. I'm your cocktail shipper for life. You can send me a text. You can send me an email at devin at hollowleg.com. You can find me on Insta and drop in like all the creepy boys do to my DMs. Okay. Um, but I would love to see your creations. I would love your questions. Father's Day is coming up. I know that like a lot of people have questions about your father-in-law loves some sort of weird scotch and what can you get him to impress him. Um, I love these questions. I'm a huge scotch fan. So anything you've got, I can help with. Give me a call. <laughs> Devin, thank you so much. It has been a delight. We appreciate all of your time, your energy, your enthusiasm, and just bringing some joy and light into our lives today. So, Well, I'm so excited, Scott. Cheers. And thank you for having me, hon. Cheers. Bye.